on the low ball show as a man who's played with Airdrieonians, Albion Rovers, Queen of the South, Partick Thistle, Stenhouse Muir and he's had a spell managing um, but he's finding a lot of success in his own businesses and an agency now as well. My guest this evening is Des McKeown. Des, thanks for coming on. My pleasure John, good to speak to you. Um, so Really kind of one of the first questions I wanted to ask is, I know you've obviously had a, a history um, in playing football, um, but getting involved in, in starting the agency, where did that kind of inspiration come from? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes wonder that inspiration hadn't <laughs> arrived. Um, that, that was pretty straightforward, actually, John. My business partner and my main business, <clears throat> excuse me, um, had two boys coming through the system at Celtic and as they were progressing through the academy he was being asked to see their background playing football as well played a bit of football um, he was being asked by their parents for their advice on certain matters and as the boys were getting older um, he was being approached by a number of different individuals who were representing agencies and looking to sign up his sons to represent him. Um, and Adrian spoke to me and said, listen, I think there's an opportunity for us to get involved here with uh, our contacts and our, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say business knowledge, but understanding of how business works. Um, I think there's a, an opportunity for us to do something here because he was being approached by, as I said, parents asking for advice in the first instance yep. anyway. The, the parents obviously trusted him because his boys and their kids had come through the academy together. And along with my involvement in football over a, a long period of time, you know, I had fairly decent contactability and whatnot. So we started off on a journey in 2016, and here we are seven years later. Uh, We've got a number of players now that are established first team players, uh, both in Scotland and in England. We started with a young group of players, but we've watched them grow and develop. We've still got a relatively young group, but hopefully, you know, where we rub of the green and um, staying injury free, some of them are going to have a career in football at different levels, you know, from yeah. anything from the Premiership in Scotland down to League Two in England, we've got players across most of those areas. And what's now turned out is there are a number of managers and former players, of, sorry, former teammates of mine who have been involved in the coaching side of the game and been involved in even as technical directors, sporting directors. They've asked ourselves, 360 Sports, to, to look after their um, careers moving forward as well. So it's, it's taken a few uh, turns in the road that I didn't probably expect to, to have to manoeuvre, but um, aye, it's it's enjoyable, it keeps me involved in the game, but by the word, it's, it's, it can be difficult at times. <laughs> because you must be really busy, because obviously, you know, we um, spoke via social media, and, and obviously with the 360 Sport, um, you're all on social media, and I know it's the kind of window for it, but at one point, I think I scrolled through my social and it was just constantly <laughs> updates from it and um, so it must be extremely busy and time consuming i well it can be john and i think a lot of people probably don't those involved in the business understand but people from outside the the agency business or outside of football in general probably don't understand or don't appreciate that's probably a better word you know the amount of time that goes into even just keeping abreast of what clubs are looking for, just so that perhaps you might have a player that might suit those needs. And I, and I don't mean that you're looking to actively upset a player. We, we certainly don't look to upset players and move players just for the sake of it. 
But I need to know almost two windows in advance what some of the clubs are likely to be looking for because it can be that far ahead. So this window obviously closes towards the end of August. I'll be immediately starting to talk to clubs both in England, Scotland, regarding what they might be requiring in January. And that could be a loan deal. It could be um, maybe a permanent if something's not worked out for one of our boys. And I'm looking to see who would, if we've got a goalkeeper, for example, that needs game time in January uh, because he's not looking as if he's going to get game time first half of the season, then I need to kind of find out, you know, what clubs are likely to be in a position to require a goalkeeper. And we might be able to, you know, start that ball rolling right away. But we're also talking in September about next summer because clubs want to know what players are coming out of contract the following year. Who could you start to talk to perhaps about... Um, potentially um, pre-contract and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it never really stops. People say, ah, well, the window's shut. You must be quiet now. It just starts all over again. You're like, we hamster on the wheel. It just keeps going. So, but listen, I'm, I'm not complaining about it. If if I didn't enjoy doing it, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't be involved in it. So it's just part, part of the job. And there's enough agents out there um, up and down the country that are facing the exact same situation as I am. And obviously you're saying you were enjoying the aspect of it and keeping involved in the game. I mean, you did have a, a fairly good career yourself. Oh, John, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to make me blush. I, I don't know. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I had a good career, John. I, I had an honest career. And when I think back to my time in the game, the game's totally different now. I mean, it's just night and day in so many ways, shapes and form. But I say that regularly to people. And uh, I wasn't intending to say this tonight, but when I when I grew up in the seventies and the early eighties, all I wanted to do was play football. So I played football for fun. Kids at eight, nine, eleven, twelve, thirteen now don't tend to play football for fun. It's almost it's a career path. Yeah. It's almost as if every, every single young player, for whatever reason, and understandably, you know, if you consider some of these top end footballers are earning nowadays, you can understand why they might want to be part of that, but it's just changed beyond all recognition, you know now, and I see it year in, year out you know, kids and their parents worrying about not getting a contract at a senior club at 16 I never actually signed for Celtic when I was 17, nobody offered me a contract until I was 16, 17 and it all happened very quickly and, and never never made it at Celtic, certainly moved on to Airdrie. Um, but I'd made a kind of early decision that I would stay on a part-time basis at Celtic and I would stay on a part-time basis at Airdrie because I was studying at Jordan Hill College at the time. I wanted to have some education behind me before I then perhaps looked at a full-time um, opportunity. That didn't really present itself, so I went and took a job in sales and did fairly well. I was very lucky because my, my managing director that I went to work for kind of mentored me and trained me and I very quickly started to earn decent money. And the fragility and the, the, the nature of football was such that, you know, you're only getting a two year contract. I, I was married, young, young family. So it very quickly became a, I knew that I was never going to go full time by the time I was 23, 24. Yeah. Because my earnings from the football and my earnings from my career were, were actually, I was never going to be, re, be able to replace my career earnings by football money because that money wasn't about in those days unless you were at the top end and I wasn't at the top end. So um, it, th th there's so many differences between my time in the game to, to nowadays. Yeah. But I had an honest career. I just loved playing football. I would have played for nothing. I didn't, but I would have, you know, and... and some would say I was probably overpaid if I'd get nothing, but I, I just wanted to play football, you know, and, and I don't see that desire in too many people now. Yeah, they want to play football, but they always want to be doing something else, you know. If, if, if something's not happening, particularly for them, and John Lambie at Partick Thistle gave me the opportunity, if I wanted to stay at the club, but he was honest enough to tell me that I, I wasn't likely to start games. So I said, I'm, I'm fine, I'm off ski. And he sold me to Queen of the South, I went back down to Queen of the South. So 
I just wanted to play football. So yeah. I, I I think I had six, 16 seasons uh, professionally as a player and I loved every minute of it. One year, I loved every minute of it. <laughs> you did get to a final, did you not? Got to the Challenge, Challenge Cup final in uh, 1997 and uh, Falkirk beat Queen of the South, won nothing at Fir Park, which was... That was a that was an incredible experience because it was the first national cup final that Queen of the South had ever been at, and we stayed down in Lockerbie eh, on the Friday and Saturday and I think the Sunday night, and coming up from Lockerbie on the Sunday to the game at Fir Park, it was absolutely amazing to see the amount of buses, the amount of cars, and the amount of blue and white Queen of the South scarves, and it was just amazing. It was brilliant for the town. And nobody could have believed that, you know, 10 years later that Queen of the South would have then been in the Scottish Cup final. I wasn't there at that time, clearly, but uh, Queen of the South won the Scottish Cup final and, and drawing the Rangers, two, two big Jim Thompson, big Palamine scored the second goal for Queens uh, and then went into Europe. So, I mean, just amazing. But in 1997, you would never have been able to predict that. And yeah. For Queen of the South, it was a massive thing. So, yeah, that, that, was, my, that was my one. Shot at glory, Robert Duval would say. And when you look, obviously, as to when you played, you know, so when we're talking about back then to now, but when I talk about changes, I mean more structurally, the way the, the kind of leagues in Scotland have went, do you see that as an improvement? I think there's a massive gap, John, between the development side. So for a young player like Des McKeown at, call it even Airdrie. Airdrie, when I was at Airdrie, if you weren't playing in the first team, you would play on a Monday night or a Tuesday night in the Reserve League West. And there was a structure to that. And actually, Celtic had dropped a team into the Reserve League West because I played for Celtic's reserves, both in the Premier League reserve, but also in the Reserve League West, which was for at that time the, the first and second division teams because only three divisions. But there was a proper structure to a young professional's career because if they weren't in the first team, they played in the second team. And that second team was punctuated by other first team players who perhaps were on the bench on the Saturday or were out of favour and didn't they actually, because again, it was two subs back then. <laughs> Um, it was perhaps only, you know, uh, as well, it's two subs, so there's 13 players, there's a squad of 18, so there's five right away, along with some young ones, maybe some trialists coming in. But every Tuesday or Wednesday, the Reserve League West happened and the Reserve League East for the clubs in East of Scotland. And I think young players now miss out on that learning process when they're playing alongside and against senior professionals. I get the biggest lesson ever playing at Celtic Park one night for Celtic's reserves against Hearts reserves where Sandy Clark absolutely destroyed me, battered me. And I mean physically battered me. And I had never I'd never come up against a senior pro like that before in my life. Hamish French did the exact same thing to me at Dundee United. Tannadice, Bobby Lennox put me out of my misery, took me off at half time. Hamish French ran me ragged and I would like to think it never happened again because I learned from it. Sandy Clark, I learned from that. Protect yourself when you're up in there because Sandy yeah. led with his elbows at a time when you could and did it brilliantly. But I don't think players, you know, the game's changed so much that even that development side doesn't happen. So there's very few and far between that young players, and I'm talking about 17, 18 year old players at Celtic or Rangers or Aberdeen playing competitive type games with first team regulars. I don't think that happens. So you don't you don't learn from those players the way that you would do playing against them or with them. So structurally, is it better? I don't think so. I think squads are too big. I think there's too many players attached to just about every level of club. Yeah. Somebody will argue that for me, but I'm sure if you consider the Celtic Rangers Academy, you know, there's almost a full under-16 group that move up and most of them will be full-time. Above that, there will have been the previous year's under-16s that are almost all full-time. 
then you'll have you know another group that's almost all full time. Whereas back in the day, and I don't mean this to sound you know reminiscing, but clubs could only sign sixteen S forms at any time, so schoolboys forms. And as soon as somebody dropped off and went on to the um, ground staff, for example, then they could bring in another one. So it was constantly rotating. They had a certain number they could have, whereas I just think there's too many players at each of the clubs now, certainly at the top end, yeah. and it's almost thrown a net over so many players. And I think that's where structurally it's not as beneficial. Because I think the only real thing they've got now with some of the clubs is the, the B teams. Yeah. They, they kind of drop down. Yeah, but again, the B team is generally made up of young players. Yeah. So if I, I watched Celtic Rangers B teams in the Lowland League over the last couple of years, and there's never really been anybody of any significant um, experience that have played in those games. And I'm, what my, my point is that when I was whether it was at Celtic, I would have played alongside. In fact, the reason I was offered a contract at Celtic, quite simply, was I was a left back and the, the late, great Tommy Burns was playing directly in front of me and literally coached me through the game in a reserve game at Dens Park one night. Tommy was coming back from injury and every time I get the ball, he had made himself, you know, available to take a pass or he would talk me through, you know, whether I time in the ball, whether it turn, whether he, and it was like having your personal coach. So I learned, I, I benefited from playing alongside, well, I was at Celtic, guys like Tommy Burns, Billy Stark, Andy Walker, Mark McGee, Mick McCarthy, all senior pros that were coming yeah. back for injury at different times. That doesn't tend to happen now. Certainly not, not as often as it did back then. And I think that's a big element of learning that, is is missed now structurally because B teams who play you know Rangers B team will play on a Saturday or a Sunday generally a Saturday Celtic's B team will generally play Saturday so their first team players aren't attached to that squad it's like a separate squad altogether yeah so does that does that or is that problem further down the line personally I think it does because if you're playing against the same now they'll be playing against more senior players at East Cobride or, or Trenent or whoever it may be. But I just think you're missing out if you're not also got one or two in your own team to be able to help and develop the younger players. Yeah, that kind of backbone of the team, you know, having aye, kind aye. of yeah. centre half, centre mid, something like that, to then kind of yeah. talk them through the game. And I think also behaviourally, you know, I think the 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 standards should be set by the senior guys at the football club. So that's not to say that, you know, the clubs don't try to set the right standards because they do. But I think if you were to have, for example, and just one name, Steve Davis at Rangers, if he was coming back from injury, imagine Steve Davis going in and playing in a B game and that the respect that the young players would have to have for that guy. Yeah. And sure they would listen to what he was telling them on the pitch. Similarly, at Celtic, I don't know who's the old guy at Celtic, James Forrest, perhaps. You know, and if he was there and he was, you know, demanding higher standards from the players, I think that would work. But it seems to be an area that it's, it's difficult to manage now for clubs to do it because, well, I don't know why. I don't, I don't actually know why. And, and I can agree with that because imagine you, the examples you gave with like Steve Davis or James Forrest, you probably find a lot of these players perhaps learning more in that kind of 90 minutes, that match build up the game and then the warm down after it and the chats after it, then they've probably learned umpteen games previously. Uh, well, that, that's how it used to work, John. And and what, uh, <clears throat> what uh, an experience for the younger players to, to you know, uh, encounter and, and just to watch these guys operating watch to see how they prepare for the game, watch to see how they go about their business on the pitch. You know, I, I just I just think it's a huge element that we miss. And yeah. I know that there'll be games programmes and, and, and the clubs will, you know, mix it up at times. But from a competitive perspective, I think 
I think we've missed something there. I would go back to the old reserve league, but it's it's no doesn't seem to be sexy enough for it. Doesn't seem to be um, in the right uh, format for the the decision makers when the game to actually get it back up and running. You know, one of the things that I kind of look at as well. If you look at the Lowland leagues, winning that league doesn't guarantee you anything. No, no, I know. And again, that's that's you know structurally how it's been presented and how it's been voted through. But if you think, you know, it's Albion Rovers, it's been East Stirling, it's been Cowdenbeath. You know, the last thing they were wanting was to have that opportunity of a, a trapdoor because if you're in the bottom division, if you're in League Two, then there's a chance that you might get through it. Do we do we need? an automatic promotion that the the complexity there is you would need to have obviously one from Highland League as well. Yeah. You know, so it, it throws up it throws up a conundrum because what happens for for two to go up, you would need two to come down type thing. So yeah. It, it's it's difficult. It's it's de- certainly difficult and I, and I don't envy the guys that have to organise it. But you would think that if you win the league, you were enti- you would be entitled to automatic promotion. But that just doesn't doesn't the way it is. You look at uh, the conference, the national league in England last year, where Notts County over a hundred points, over a hundred goals, most wins I think ever in their career, and they still didn't get automatic promotion. So they had to go through the playoffs to get up to League Two. Wrexham in the year that Wrexham had came at the fore. Notch County were right on their coattails. So, you know, every association has their own foibles. And in Scotland, that is that, you know, Club 42 get a chance to breathe again, you know. And she's kind of talking about day leagues, obviously. Um, you kind of mentioned Albion Rovers there. Was that a surprise to you? You know, with that being a, a club that you were associated with as well, did you still find an affiliation there? I listen, disappointed. I was disappointed for Albion Rovers. I had four very happy years at, at Clifton Hill. Uh, happy in the respect that I met some great friends. I worked under some really good people. And it was it was a it was an environment where I enjoyed playing football. Um did it surprise me? Probably not. Probably not. Disappoints me as a former club. You always want to see your former clubs do well. You certainly don't want to see them, you know, drop out the leagues. Um, but I think it's so precarious now in that, that division in League Two that, for a whole host of different reasons, primarily financially, I would suggest a number of those clubs have uh, have bitten the dust in terms of dropping out the league. I think that's. Is that four now? Cowdenbeath, Berwick, East Stirling and Albion Rovers. Yeah. So there's four have gone out and when you consider the money that's been invested in other clubs, it will be a real tough challenge for them to get back out. You've got Breakin in the Highland, there's five Breakin in the Highland League, although I think Breakin obviously just missed out this time and I think they, knowing the people behind the scenes at Breakin, I think they'll, they'll give it a real good go again this year. And until we get back up, um, but it's it's difficult. It's really difficult because there's a lot of other clubs that have emerged since the opportunity for the Lowland League and the Highland League to get a a, a foot in the, the the Scottish leagues. That they're finding, they're getting investment because they're local community clubs. And I mean, even like what surprised me was Spartans. Um, I went over there a couple of times throughout the season. Yeah. And it was the setup they had there. I thought there was teams in League Two, possibly even League One, that would have been envious of the setup that they'd kind of built there as well. You know, but you see these clubs in the low leagues that have got that kind of structure and setup to progress. I listen, you only need to look back. All right, it's. I was going to say, you only need to look back 20-odd years, but it's, it's actually more. 
that Ross County and Inverness came in and, and you've then had Elgin and Peter Ed. There are a lot of significant clubs, and I say significant, I mean in terms of strong community presence. And when you've got a strong community presence, you've got half a chance because a lot of these clubs, you know, it's Sp Spartans have been around and caused upsets for many, many years and well-managed, good football people at the helm. And it's probably it was probably a surprise to many because they're maybe not seen as the, the club that are likely to go and spend the money to get up. But you don't just always need to spend money. Queen's Park, until they went professional, had been in the leagues for forever and, and had, you know, won League Two and challenged in the the, the old second division to go up into the, the second tier. So at that time they weren't paying MD anything. So if your if your equation for success is how much are you spending, then Queen's Park should never have won anything and never done anything, but they did. So it's not always, you know, what you spend, it's how you spend it yeah. and how you invest it and how you invest in your people. And Spartans are a great example of that. And just to then kind of take a look, look just now the, the Via Play Cup has started. Um, quite a few, uh, like, say, managers that I've spoken with recently, um, where they're quite happy with the Cup, the kind of starting dates here, um, you know, with the lack of pre-season, is something that kind of every one of them mentions. I think, I can't remember who it was that had said that um, within the last couple of years, it seems to have come forward two weeks from what it was previously. Um, do you think that's a reason yeah. for a lot of the upsets? I I, I would def I would definitely subscribe to the via play games at this stage being an extension of preseason, and I'm I'm not saying that the clubs are treating them like that, but by the very science of the time involved in getting your squad together it must be because i mean again back in the day we, we would have started the, the end of june maybe for six weeks to start playing at the beginning of august whereas the guys are back and i think the first club back might have been wraith rovers and i think that was the 12th of june that was four weeks ago and they've already played in the via play cup yeah so it's it's pretty dramatic the change you know in terms of how how condensed the period is from a pre-season straight into games i mean a number of the clubs have had two maybe three games and then straight into a cup game so i, I think listen great to see upsets uh, no great if you're in the receiving end of them but it's it, i don't think you can i don't think you can predict who's going to do what this season based on the games that we've witness so far let's yeah. just say that because then if you look at if we take the kind of championship um looking at that is there a specific team that you know because i know you know you could probably pick out multiple especially last season i think every team bar one had something to play for in the last game yeah but is yeah. there a team that you would perhaps pick out and say oh that's a team to watch or you kind of fancy them to do really well I'm, I'm going to I'm going to say something that the via play seed, but I fully expect the United to come straight back up. I think obviously the first two results haven't been good, but I think the United will be the team to beat. What Chris Doolan has achieved at Partick Thistle has been tremendous, and I think Thistle will. If they can get a couple of more bodies in, there'll be a real force in there as well. And yeah, Queen's Park surprised everybody last year, I think. Air United had an unbelievable season. Wraith Rovers, new owners, some very, very good signings. So uh, there's, there's some terrific matches in the, the championship. But I, I would, I, if I was a betting man, which I'm not particularly, I would I would put whatever I was going to bet, I would put it on Dundee United. 
And do you know what? To be fair, I kind of agree with that. That was my pick out, obviously before the via play cup uh, yeah. games. But I kind of looked at it the same way you did. They saying it was a bit of an extension to their pre season because a lot of these clubs are still bringing pre-season. players in. Yeah, yeah, and and I think also, John, that when there are so many competitive teams in the league. You only really need to go on a decent run to eliminate everybody else because they'll take points off each other. Yeah. So it's up to you, you as a club to go on a you know a run of five, six, seven wins. If that happens, I think very quickly there could be separation because you know Wraith Rovers, Inverness, somebody we didn't mention, are both God, you you get Dick Campbell pulling up trees at every turn, you know, and, and digging out results. Um, so there's there's some real competitive games in there that if anybody gets on a bit of a roll and gets any momentum, then I think they could just disappear away from everybody else. And then looking at League One, which I think quite interesting because there's quite a split of full-time and part-time clubs. Yeah. And they're, and especially with clubs that have just kind of dropped into it, um, it's kind of made that split slightly more even. And, yep. I, you know, that's the one, that's one of the kind of leagues that I find, I'm go, I think I'm going to find really interesting because looking at it. Aye. And, I th- <clears throat> and, and, and again, if I was a betting man, I hope nobody's listening to take <laughs> my, my, my tips. If I was a betting man, I think it's a shootout between Falkirk and Hamilton. But I'll caveat yeah. that with, Cove under Paul Hartley now that they're full-time as well, I think will be a match for anybody in that division on their day. And Queen of the South, Mill Club, who knows? I mean, they, they ran Motherwell really close. Navaya play. Um, well, Queen of the South could, could be involved in that as well. So it's, it's going to be really interesting again. But I think, I think... John McGlynn's second season, better chance to get his own players in because I think he inherited a, a load of players last year. So he's been able to do a bit more in the transfer window. Um, and I like John and Paul Smith uh, as coaches and people who develop teams and players. So I think Falkirk might very well be the team to beat, but I think Hamilton, possibly Queen of the South and Cove, the full-time clubs I think will will be there or thereabouts in that division. And then if we look at League Two, which again, I kind of think, probably like most of these uh, leagues is pretty wide open. I well, here's the wee tip for you then. I'm going to go for Forfa. That's my that's my tip. I just think Ray McKinnon, since he came in tail end of last year in January, managed to get a few bodies in. He's recruited again and... Uh, has has started. He's done his, the pre seasons been good for him uh, and the club. And I think Forfar might be the team to beat there. Although I, I should again caveat that by saying every single year somebody comes out that you don't really expect yeah. and surprises you. And and who's to say you know that that could literally be any day this season. Gary Naismith at Stennis Muir. It could be. Um, Spartans. It could it could be it could be a really interesting. I think all the leagues are, are fascinating. The top division, um, we don't talk about that. But the top top division, I think, will will be a shootout between two. Yeah. And I think one one one's already sitting um, probably favourites because they've got a more settled group. Um, but the championship, and I never even mentioned Dunfermline in the championship. What an addition back into the championship, Dunfermline, fantastic. So you've got. You know, some brilliant, brilliant um games to see over the course of this season. And it'll be it'll be really interesting to see how the three from the championship, League One, League Two, how they play out. Um and just kind of finally, Des, I really appreciate you taking the time this evening. Um no, no to come on. Um it's been really good. The the final question I've got for you is if you could pick anybody to play you in a film about your life. Who would you pick? <laughs> it's a great question, John. 
It's also a question that I ask people. There, that's brilliant. That's funny. <laughs> so I think <clears throat> it's obviously not going to be MD we here. So I'm going to go for Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis, you know what? I, I, I can kind of see that. No, I, I don't mean that I look like. I wish I did look <laughs> like. Trust me. He's going through a hard time right enough. But um, I, Bruce Willis probably, because actually I like his personality as well as his, uh, his acting skills. And he would need to be a right good actor to try and do <laughs> what I do. <laughs> so no, I'll go with Bruce Willis. I'd love to say Frank Sinatra, who's up above me here. Yeah. He's far, he's far too classy, uh, and he and he wouldn't he, he wouldn't even entertain it. So uh, we'll go with Bruce Willis. There you go. Well, hopefully then that you'll come back on and you'll wear the Die Hard vest. <laughs> as long as you don't say yippee ki yay and all that stuff, <laughs> I okay. Right, that, that might be a deal, but I'm not so sure. I'll probably look more like Rab C Nesbit <laughs> Bruce Willis. <laughs> um, well, there's. Uh, all the best with the, the agencies. I see, I, I see it in social media constant. So obviously, I know that's going fantastic. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to come on. I've really enjoyed it. And hopefully, end of the season, we come back on and look at the predictions. Aye, thanks for that, John. Well, listen, <laughs> if, if it's going well, I'll be phoning you, don't worry. No, listen, I appreciate your time. Best of luck with the podcast. It's been brilliant speaking to you and reminiscing about a few of the yesteryears. But uh, wish you all the best. Thank you, Des. I appreciate it. Take care. All of us. Thank, Thank you. Mate. Cheers. Bye.